The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All Hit Radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. For those of you who have been asking, where is Hamilton, Rob? I'd like to see you on the world map. Well, you can go to Google, uh, Google Earth, and just type in Hamilton, Ontario. Or if you're doing it the old-fashioned way with a piece of paper map, or how about those old things we have in our libraries called globes? We are on the shores of Lake Ontario in the province of Ont- uh, on, in the province of Ontario, and if you find Toronto and you go south along the lake to Niagara Falls, smack dab in the middle, you'll find the city of Hamilton, which is known as Steel Town here in Canada. Uh, we're coming to you tonight on the Exxon Broadcast Network, Talkstar Radio Network, Mutual Broadcast Network, and iHeartRadio. If you'd like to send me an email, exxonradiotv.com on all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV. And to find out about the great programming we have available for each and every one of you around the world, with our compliments, 24-7, 365, on the Exxon Broadcast Network, just visit www.xzbn.net. Exxon Nation, my guest this hour is Major General Mark Music, who is retired. And uh, Mark retired from the military in 2008 at the rank of Major General. In 2002, Mark met Eva uh, McClelland, who told him a secret which she had not divulged to anyone else. However, since her husband of 31 years had just died, it was time to tell someone. Her story consisted of the ingredients of a fabulous wealth, a reclusive man unable to escape his famous life, assistance from the CIA providing an alternative identity, and a loving wife who knew how to keep such a secret. The first book, Boxes, The Secret Life of Howard Hughes, was released in 2010. During the last six years, additional information continued to come forward to confirm Eva's wild story. The second book is now published. Let's hear about the details of how Howard Hughes pulled the wool over the eyes of the public and lived his last 25 years with a woman he loved, finally dying in November of 2001. My guest this hour, Major General, retired Mark Music. We're going to be talking about the fake death and final decades of Howard Hughes. First of all, Mark, I'd like to thank you for your service to our country and to the peace and the freedom that we all enjoy today. Well, Rob, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And thanks for having me on the show. Oh, it's my great pleasure, sir. Um, Tell us a little bit about this encounter that you had with Eva McClelland and why she decided to tell you her story. Well, it's it's, uh, very unusual. I met Eva uh, personally in 2002, and I was working for a nonprofit, and Eva had made contact with the nonprofit in 1999 or 2000 uh, regarding some property that she had. Mm-hmm. And so I talked to her on the phone several times. She knew I was in the military. At that point, I was in the National Guard. She knew I was in the military, and we got very comfortable with each other. And then I knew her husband was getting older, and, and he passed away then in November 2001. I was in Georgia in January 2002. So I decided I'm just going to go meet her. And so I went I went to meet her, uh, found her to be a very a personable woman, a very smart lady and, and um, very good memory, uh, but very paranoid. And she mm-hmm. said, Mark, there's something that I want to tell you. And I said, well, what is that, Eva? 
And she said, I was married to Howard Hughes. And of course, I thought this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. This lady's absolutely loony. And I said, Eva, Howard Hughes died 25 years ago. And she said, that's what they want you to believe. And then she started telling me the story that she had met a man in 1969 living in Panama. They got to know each other. They became engaged. They became married. And she wasn't sure. He was using a name of, of a Nick Nicoly is the name he was using, Nick Nicoly. However, he had the identity of a man named Werner Nicely. And so she was not really uh, – sh- he would disappear from her. Mm-hmm. Uh, he did, he just leave sometimes for months at a time. But uh, but she ultimately loved the guy. She loved the guy. He was hard to live with. His personality would change back and forth. He'd go out at night and and uh, do business, make contacts at night. And and they were married then in May of 1970. She knew there was great mystery with this man, um, but she didn't know exactly what it was all about. And then she began to put the pieces together. And she discovered, I'm married to Howard Hughes. He's living under an identity provided him uh, by the CIA, by the government. And as we then, as I t- heard this story, I thought this is craziness. It can't possibly be true. Right. So, so I went back and started to research. Uh, went back and found birth certificates of this man Werner Nicely, of the identity that he had. I actually, talked to some of his family members and found out that yeah, he disappeared. Um, he was was working for the CIA. He was working counter drug in Panama, uh, and he disappeared. And now he was five foot eleven. We have all of his all of his medical records. Eva got all of his medical records, all of his motel records. So we have all of those for Vernon Nicely. And now Vernon Nicely, instead of being five foot eleven, now is six foot four. And um, uh, always doing business, uh, disappears yeah. when he when he needs to disappear. And um, she begins to put it together bit by bit. It took her about three years to figure out that this guy was Howard Hughes. And then it was it was 1974, 75 that he revealed it to her. He said, well, I'm, I'm Howard Hughes. And from there on out, uh, she could ask him anything. She asked him about his childhood. She asked him about flying the, uh, the Spruce Goose Spruce to Hercules. Goose, yeah. She asked him about the flight around the world in 1938 and so forth. Mm-hmm. And, of course, he, he talked about all of it at that point. How did Eva authenticate that this was indeed Howard Hughes and not an imposter who was just very well prepped on on the, all the the inner workings of, of Mr. Hughes were there fingerprint identifications made or how, how was the how was the proof done well that's very that's a very good question because it took it took a long time to put this story together mm-hmm. um well, first of all we started with the height uh th- this man was was six foot four right uh he was six foot four so he was a tall man and um uh Eva began to realize what was really going on because of things that he would um, uh, that he that he would disappear for her, and they'd be separated at times. And as we put this story together, those are the times when Howard Hughes was having meetings with uh, the president of Nicaragua, with the governor of Nevada, and things like that. And so everything between when they were together and when they were apart, we put those all together. Eva really um, uh, began to put it together. When he started talking about his childhood, and the childhood of the man Werner Nicely was in Ohio. Uh, he was born in Ohio, 1921. Mm-hmm. Was raised with the two brothers, one sister. His dad was a baker. Uh, did well in school. Then went into the military after that in 1942. And when when Nick Howard talked about his childhood, his childhood was always: I was born in Texas. I was an only child. My parents died very young. Uh, I spent a lot of time with my grandparents. I was always sent to uh, to school, your boarding schools, and things like that. My parents fought like cats and dogs. I played the uh, the saxophone. Um, I had a motorized bicycle, and and uh, those type of things. And so everything that he had, had they got together, and as he was talking about his his childhood, it all matched Howard Hughes's childhood. None of it matched uh, Vernon Nicey's childhood. 
And so those were those are the things that she began to put. Then, then he finally said, I'm Howard Hughes. And as we looked at, at pictures, you know, we've, the name of the book is Boxes, The Secret Life of Howard Hughes. Mm-hmm. Eva wanted it named Boxes because he would not let her unpack. She had to live from boxes because they had to be able to leave uh, very, very quickly. Why? Uh, he was a very reclusive man to begin with. He disappeared from the public in the early 50s. Mm-hmm. Uh, very, very reclusive man. And um, um, he he was uh, afraid of, of someone coming to find him. Because one thing, he was dealing with, uh, with uh, alternate identity that he didn't want anybody to know about. Um, when Howard Hughes finally died in 1976, they were living actually in... Uh, a, a house west of Troy, Alabama, about six miles, seven miles west of Troy, Alabama. And the aides were always with them. The aides were uh, were continuously with them from that time that she met him in 1969 until uh, the time to stand and died in 76. And then the aides basically uh, disappeared after that. But they're living in there. Up until that time, he would go into Troy, Alabama with her, we have uh, dinner, have lunch, you know, go to the hardware store, those type of things. After that, he wouldn't go anywhere. All right, stand by, there. please, uh, Mark. We've got to take our first break. Exxon Nation. Mark Music is our special guest this hour. We're talking about the fake death and final decades of Howard Hughes. www.boxeshowardhughessecrets. Dot com. This is the Exxon. I'm Rob McConnell. We'll be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember, 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. Gwilda Wiaka's latest book, The Science of Magic, Book of Mysteries, Volume 1, is the first book in a series based on her writings that open every episode of The Science of Magic radio show. Drawing on the subject matter of each guest, And armed with over 40 years' experience in shamanism, 35 years in alternative health, and degrees in psychology and religious studies, Wilda introduces relevant and leading-edge information that supports spiritual evolution and personal empowerment. Rich with wisdom and inspirational quotes packaged in digestible segments, this is a book that will pull you from cover to cover. It will also serve as a daily inspirational reading for years to come. The Science of Magic Book of Mysteries, Volume 1, is available at our website, tsompublications.com, amazon.com, and wherever fine books are sold. Back in Victorian England, a famous theologian posed a perplexing riddle. Why are the two top personalities in the Bible tagged with the numbers 7 and 11? Academics agree the answer is found in the stunning discovery of a hitherto secret Bible structure explained in a new book called The Genesis Grid. The discovery is so simple that preschool children could illustrate it. Certain claims are hugely controversial and may offend some, but at the X-Zone, we've studied this awesome new book and agree with one expert, and I quote, These discoveries appear to be beyond coincidence. So who or what hid this wonderful pattern in the Bible, and what might they do next? Find out more, X-Zone Nation, and read reviews on www.genesisgrid.co.uk. That's www.genesisgrid.co.uk.
And welcome back to the Exxon, everyone. My guest this hour is Mark Music. We're talking to Mark about his uh, book that is entitled Boxes, The Secret Life of Howard Hughes, and it was co-authored by Douglas Wellman. It's available on Amazon.com. And um, for more information, visit www.boxeshowardhughessecrets.com. How did you feel when you were able to confirm all the information that you were getting that this lady, Eva McClelland, was the actual wife of the elusive and presumed dead previously Howard Hughes? Boy, that's a, that's a good question, Rob, because as we we're putting this story together, like I said, for the first four years that I dealt with her, I didn't believe her. I thought this can't possibly be true. This is lunacy. Mm -hmm. uh, it can't possibly be true. But as we started to put the parts together, and I went and started reading books about Howard Hughes, I found out it, it, I found out in 1972 and 73 his life was very very strange. It was a very strange life because it starts out in 1972 where he's having a, an interview with seven with six journalists in Los Angeles. Right. And and they said. It, it's his voice. He answers the questions. Everything's right. He describes himself as, well, I don't have long fingernails. I keep myself pretty physically fit. Mm -hmm. And and so there's a beginning, beginning to be a discrepancy here because the media now has Howard Hughes as a long fingernail, long haired, yeah. drug addicted, emaciated, 90 pound derelict. That's what he's described as there. Now we have um, uh, six weeks after this interview, we have Howard Hughes leaving the Bahamas going to Nicaragua and the captain of the boat is a little boat that they had transporting him, uh, described him as just, again, this long haired, long figure, no guy wrapped up in an overcoat hat pulled down over his head, you know, non, non conversant, so mm. forth. Six weeks after that, Howard Hughes meets with the president of Nicaragua. He describes him as a commanding man. He's a charming man. He's a man that I'd like to be friends with. You know, he's in charge of his business. And then in the fall of that year, 72, Howard Hughes meets with Merrill Lynch representatives and sells some some uh, Hughes uh, Corporation stock. They, they said, well, this is a commanding man in charge of his business. Uh, in December that year, there was an earthquake in Nicaragua. Howard Hughes was taken from Nicaragua to Florida and then on to England. In Florida, he was met with the IRS and customs in Florida. They described him again as this derelict, this guy who couldn't even say his name, who was wrapped up in a, in a raincoat, hat pulled down over his head. So now we're back to that derelict guy. Yeah. In, in March of 73, Howard meets in the middle of the night with the governor of Nevada. The governor of Nevada is wondering what's going on here. Howard Hughes owns, you know, an, an eighth in Nevada, and, and he's described as just derelict. And so Howard Hughes meets with him. The governor of Nevada says he knows what he's doing. He's a healthy man. He's in, he, he knows uh, he's a charming man. Now you have Howard Hughes in, in June of 73 flying airplanes in England. And again, the, uh, the, the pilot who was with him, a, guy, a gentleman named Tony Blackman, who was with him, said, uh, again, a friendly, commanding man. Howard flew the airplane at that point in time. Now, August of 73... Howard Hughes falls in a hotel in London. The doctor comes in and says, he looks like an emaciated Japanese oh prisoner gosh. of war. And they declared him mentally incompetent. So right there in those two years, it becomes pretty clear that you've got two people. Right. You have, you have two men there. They're two separate men. However, it's so confusing that the media can never tell what's really going on. And they would actually set up meetings with the stand-in. Mm-hmm. They would set up meetings with the stand-in. So they'd say, Rob, you have a meeting with, with Howard Hughes, and you go meet him, and he's got this horrible breath, and his teeth are rotted out, and he's got hair and long fingernails. And you said, well, I've met him. And you described him. Oh, no, that's Howard. And so there, there was this confusion generated on purpose about Howard Hughes because Howard wanted to hide. He wanted to hide. He found a way to do it. The CIA 
uh, was with him all the way. The identity that he took was a CIA operative. In fact, the identity comes up at the same time that the CIA goes to him and says, there's a, there's a Russian submarine that sank northwest of Hawaii, 700 miles northwest of Hawaii. Would you go raise it, Howard? And Howard said yes, and he did. He built a Glomar Explorer and raised it. Mm-hmm. But what we think, this is our speculation, what he think he said was, I'll go do that. You get me another identity. And the identity that they gave him was a CIA operative that just disappeared. Why oh, did the, in what year did the media believe that Howard Hughes died? 1976. Okay. Nineteen seventy, and that that was a stand-in. They took the stand-in and moved him around and around. Finally, he ended up in Acapulco, uh, Mexico, and uh, died in nineteen seventy. Died in nineteen seventy-six. Now, Eva and Nick, at that point in time, were living in in a small house well, west of Troy, Alabama. Right. And the aides were with them. The aides were living about another mile down the road, across the road from them. So the aides were always there to protect them. Them was Mormon aides. They were always there to protect him. And they were listening because Eva knows at this point in time that she's married to Howard Hughes. Right. And so they're listening to the radio because he wouldn't let her have a TV. They're listening to the radio. And so and Eva says, you know, the public's going to realize that something's really wrong here because they're trying to get the body in the ground too fast. And Nick says to Eva, you really realize who your friends are when you fake your death and you see who shows up at the service. And at the service was twenty about 24, 25, 24 people. Twenty three of them were cousins. Right. Most of whom he'd never even met before. The twenty the twenty fourth one was a CIA representative. Can I ask you this this question, Mark? How do we know that Eva didn't marry the double and that the real Howard Hughes died? Um, we've gotten several inputs on who that double was. Okay. Uh, we've gotten several inputs on that. There's a Hollywood story on it that we just don't believe at all. Um, and then Howard had many doubles um, in his life. He had people who looked like him, mm-hmm. who who they would send into meetings and things. Um, they were much. They were mostly younger than he was, though. They're mostly younger than he was, uh, and um, uh, they'd send him into meetings. And Howard also, we have found, used uh, in his life of what we've run into, used uh, about four different names, alias names. Uh, this name of Werner Nicely or Nick Nickley was just one of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, he enjoyed uh, throwing confusion into everything that he did uh, in this thing. And so what we had, she became convinced that it was him. Well, after he told her, she had figured it out in about 73. She'd figured it out. In 74, 75, um, he had uh, he revealed it to her. And then from there on out, uh, he would talk anything about she wanted. And many of the things that he relayed to her were things that are never written in books. Uh, there's a lot written about Howard Hughes. Most of it is, is uh, uh, questionable at best. But the things were never written in books. And then we've had other people come to us. Mm-hmm. Who were who had interacted with Howard Hughes, telling us the same things. So Eva's story begins to all come together when we get other independent uh, inputs from people who interacted with Howard Hughes and her, and they're telling us things that's never ever defined anywhere, never written anywhere, and they all match. They all come together. Now that Howard Hughes has passed. Um, has has Eva passed as well, as well, or is she still around? Uh, sadly, Eva passed away in 2009. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I worked with Eva from 2002 to 2009 uh, with the story, putting together the story. Mm-hmm. Eva did not want it to come out until after she passed away because she was afraid of it. Um, she did not want it to come out. And as, as it turned out, it didn't come out. Um, she was a marvelous lady. She was a very intelligent lady. She, um, uh, as a person, she liked Pepsi. Yeah. And she liked uh, chocolate. And she liked classical music. And her memory was just amazing. Uh, nothing in her story ever changed. No details, no even words between conversation between her and her husband. Nothing ever modified in her story. 
And that was part of what kind of brought me to the conclusion of maybe there's something to this story. Because even we talk about about uh, events that happen, yes. and she would talk about conversations between her and Nick, and nothing would ever be modified on that. There was uh, there was one time I I was visiting with her, and there was an in, there was a uh, uh, incident, and I asked, okay, Eva, when did this particular incident happen? Mm-hmm. And I was only looking for like, oh, it was April of seventy four. That's all I was looking for. And Eva thought for just a minute. She says, it was just before noon on a Saturday. And that's how specific she was in her details. We were asking her questions two weeks prior to her passing. And she was answering the questions just like what she'd answered them three or four or five years earlier. Um, We read the book two or three times because she wanted nothing uh, made up. She wanted no Hollywood in the book. She wanted nothing made up in the book. Everything had to be accurate. And she made sure that it was accurate. If I had made a mistake in something something that I'd written in the down – she she made sure that I she corrected me on that that I got it right on uh, on what what was uh, uh, happening there at that point. Mark, please stand by, sir. You and I have to take our break for the news at the bottom of the hour. No, I think we did that already, right, Craig? No, this is the bottom break. Okay. Um, Mark, music is my special guest this hour. Explanation: www.boxeshowardhughessecrets.com. And we're talking about uh, the secret life of Howard Hughes. Fascinating uh, conversation with our guest, Mark Music, and we'll both be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. From our broadcast studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, to the world and beyond. You're watching the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. ABS Media The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State certified occupational school training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the X-Zone Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. Rob McConnell here, presenting an overview for Nicholas Paul Jinnick's, author of a fascinating book, Amen. It presents facts revealed by Egyptologists, facts that enable us to understand why Amen is the beginning of creation of God. It provides recommendations for religious leaders of the major religions to unify their beliefs and teach the Word of God, love one another. Amen informs people how mankind conceived God. It was the Egyptians that developed the concepts of a soul, a hereafter, and son of God, and finally, After the worship of many gods, they conceived the belief in one universal God, the maker of all there is. 
For more information, visit www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. Welcome back, everyone. We're talking about Howard Hughes this hour, and here's seven things you may not know about Howard Hughes. He was one of the world's wealthiest men. Howard Robert Hughes Jr. was a Hollywood filmmaker, record-setting aviator, a business mogul who once owned a big chunk of Las Vegas and controlled a major U.S. airline, and that airline was TWA, among other ventures. Later in life, however, he became an, a, an eccentric refuse who feared germs and uh, shunned personal hygiene. And uh, some of the other things you may not know about Mr. Hughes is, number one, he was a millionaire at the age of 18. Number two, he is directional debut. Hell's Angels was one of the most expensive movies of its time. Number three, Howard Hughes set an around-the-world flight record. Number four, his famous Bruce Spruce Goose aircraft was flown only once, and that'll teach me to suck on a cough drop and talk at the same time. Number five, Howard Hughes was part of a CIA plot to recover a sunken Soviet submarine. Number six, when a Vegas hotel tried to kick him out, he bought the place. And number seven, a planned Howard Hughes biography turned out to be a hoax, and that was going back to 1971 with the McGraw-Hill uh, publication. Our guest this hour is Mark Muncie, a music, I'm sorry, Mark Music. He is a former retired um, general major. And once again, uh, sir, thank you very much for your service to your country. Now that, um, now that Eva McClelland has passed and Howard Hughes has passed, what is the significance of this book? What it does, I think, it, well, basically it's a love story. Uh, it's a love story between between uh, Eva, mm -hmm. a very common person, and the richest man in the world, the richest man in America at that point in time, who was hiding. And, and she loved him. He was hard to live with. He had uh, his personality would change from being a very charming man mm -hmm. to being a very verbally, verbally vicious man to her. And so his personality would change. But she put up with it. There'd be times when she would just leave him uh, for months at a time. She'd just leave him because she couldn't she couldn't uh, handle him and deal with him. But they'd always get back together. And so they ultimately uh, it, it, it's basically a love story there. Uh, and then and then her hiding away with him, mm -hmm. uh, keeping his secret because he wanted that secret kept. He could not afford to have it found out that he just took on another identity. He just he just took on the identity of another man who was living living in the woods of Alabama. But why not? He could, that he could never um, he he was hiding from something, and I don't know exactly what that was. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it was the mafia, because he purchased all the hotels from the mafia, and he actually had mafia ties back in the forties, right? Nineteen forties, he had mafia connections, and so I don't think it was the mafia. Uh, possibly it was something that he would had done with the CIA. Uh, I don't know. That'd be speculation. Uh, but he was hiding from something during that period of time, and he and, and then he was just also reclusive by nature. But if he, he was, was hiding, a, he, was, it, he was just a private man by nature. But didn't the CIA give him a, a different identity so the CIA would know where he was and who he was? So that that one doesn't make sense. Um, yeah, yeah, the CIA is the one that provided that. So I think the CIA knew exactly where yeah. he was. Um, but I don't know what I don't know what the uh, the reason for the hiding was, um, other than the fact that he just wasn't supposed to be alive and he wanted to make sure that that uh, he wasn't found out. During the, your investigation into the story, uh, what was the most awe-inspiring moment that you and uh, Doug had? Okay, uh, we had a, there's a couple. One of them was the time that I actually came to believe Eva. Mm -hmm. And and it was the summer of uh, 2006. I talked to her for four years on this thing. And we'd gone back to where they lived, and we went through Alabama, and we had the medical records and the military records, all those type of things. She had all that stuff. But I didn't believe it. I just didn't believe it. And then it was the summer of 2006, and I asked Eva, I said, Eva, do you have a picture of him? Mm-hmm. And at that point, Eva never showed me a picture of him. 
And she said he never wanted his picture taken. He never wanted his taken. She said, but I think I have one or two. And and um, and she began to look through her boxes there that she was living out of, basically, and pulled out a couple of these, you know, three and a half by three and a half pictures taken of a man a long ways away mm-hmm. um, in a in a in a just a field type thing. And I looked at him and I did not see Howard Hughes in these pictures, did not at all. And all I saw was a tall man. And so I said, Eva, can I have these? And Eva said, yes, you can have these. And it was right there. It was right there that I concluded she's telling me the truth. Because I was actually talking to a lady in the uh, Houston Police Department at the same time and talking to her about this story. And she said, the Houston Police Department lady said, if this lady was lying to you, she would never give you anything. You would never get anything away from her. And in essence, she gave me everything. I have all of the pictures that right. she has us in. I have all of the medical records, all of the military records. We went and back, got military records. He was being served at the uh, VA in Montgomery, Alabama. And we went and got those records. And it sort of been in 1999, 2000. And there again, he was still uh, 72 inches tall at that point. You know, he was still taller than Vernon Nice's original height was. And it talked about, where did you grow up? I grew up in Texas. Mm-hmm. I, I was an only child. My parents died young. It said, what were your hobbies when you were younger? I used to fly airplanes. Yeah. Even there, the records, just everything just fits like a glove. What uh, branch of that. which branch of the military was he in? He wasn't. So how could he, he be? Wasn't. How could he go into the VA hospitals? That's very interesting because the identity that he took mm-hmm. was a military man. The identity that he took, Werner Nicely, yeah. was it was a military veteran, a very good one, by the way. Um, and that was what he was uh, lender that identity. He could go in, and there again with the government helping him he could probably go about wherever he wanted to go but uh but he he was in several um uh, he was in a couple vas because of of that uh uh, uh that connection with the with the with the real veteran so would this mean that the military was also complicit in this cover up i don't know that uh I, that would be pure speculation I do not know that uh, at all. Uh, it's pretty clear that the CIA was, but I'm not sure the military was. As a member of the military yourself, uh, during the during the time when your application is filed, uh, aren't you required to be fingerprinted? Um, yes. Yeah, there's some fingerprints associated with, with uh, being um, uh, allowed to have mm-hmm. classified documents and being access to classified documents. Were the fingerprints of this alleged, uh, of how, the person who claimed to be Howard Hughes, ever uh, authenticated? I don't, I don't remember seeing those fingerprints uh, in the records. Because I uh, have to go back and, and do it. The, the original yeah. man. Because That's what, what you're talking about, the, the original man? I'm, th- I'm talking about the person who, whose identity that Howard Hughes took the identity that was uh, given to him by the CIA. Um, because if this person, whose identity Howard Hughes had taken, had fingerprints, wouldn't somebody have already cued into this? Well, wait a minute, this guy claiming to be Nick Nicely, the fingerprints don't match. Well, first of all, when you go into the VA, nobody's taking your fingerprints. So the the problem the issue because the fingerprints I looked at that quite mm-hmm. handily, the fingerprints become what do you compare those to? So if the military records of Werner Nicely had fingerprints though, where do you compare those to? And uh, uh, Howard Hughes, Nick Nickley, Werner mm-hmm. Nicely, whoever right. you want to call him, um, always wore gloves. Now he wore gloves. We think for several reasons. One, he was a germaphobe. Mm-hmm. And because he wore gloves, the other one, his hands were all damaged from the fire, uh, aircraft fire in 1946. He was he was heavily uh, burned in 1940. His hands and feet were damaged there. And so he wore gloves to to uh, uh, cover up so he wouldn't hit his hands on some things. 
And then he also wore gloves because you wouldn't leave fingerprints, right. we think. And so that man, that man tended to wear gloves all the time. Even remembers, you know, very few times that he didn't have gloves on. But he, uh, uh, we do have a picture of him later on. Uh, but we, it's in the second book. We didn't have it when the first book came out. But it was a picture of Nick in 1991. And it's got him uh, standing kind of with a Oreo Riggers hat on mm-hmm. um, with a beard. And his hands, you could see his hand. He didn't have gloves on at this point in time. His hands were damaged. Right. Uh, his hands were injured in some way. And so the fingerprint thing becomes much more difficult if you don't have fingerprints to compare them to. Um, and then, um, it, of course, he didn't want his fingerprints out there, too. He hid his fingerprints away. What happened to his vast fortune? Uh, when he died in 1976, uh, the books say his fortune was worth about $2.2 billion. Mm-hmm. And that got distributed over a period of a long, many, many years uh, to his cousins. Uh, you remember the 23 cousins that were at the, at at the, the service? Yeah. That pretty much went to those cousins as well as the IRS and the, and the lawyers. I think probably did a pretty good – took a pretty good chunk on that too. But his uh, – that wealth uh, was distributed amongst those cousins after years and years and years and years and years of discussion. All right. Stand by, please, Mark. We've got to take our final break. Exxon Nation, Mark Music is our special guest of this hour. Talking about Mark's book, Boxes, The Secret Life of Howard Hughes. It was written by Mark Music and his co-author, Douglas Wellam. www.boxes, secret, Howard, wait a minute, uh, www.boxeshowardhughessecrets.com. We'll be back on the other side of this break as we wrap up this hour here in the X-Zone. Don't go away. Named one of the world's greatest psychics, Elizabeth Joyce is now giving readings worldwide via Skype. Elizabeth Joyce is recognized for her clairvoyant ability to help find missing persons, her analysis of dreams, past life regression work, mediumship, and her accurate predictions. Elizabeth has been a frequent guest on the X-Zone radio show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, now for several years. For an appointment with Elizabeth Joyce, call 201-934-8986 or Skype at elizabeth.joyce. And for more information, you can always visit Elizabeth Joyce online at www.new-visions.com. The new nonfiction book, Razor of Madness, is similar to cult movies like Clockwork Orange, Dragon's Tattoo, or The Other Side of Hell. Wayne Morin Jr. and Thomas Lee Howe will expose widespread and systematic deficiencies in this thought-provoking tell-all novel. Mind control rages among scholars in law schools. Human rights are ignored while thought reform and mental manipulation are accepted practices used as behavior modification. Dr. Louis Jolion West comes to mind. Media and public scrutiny shows that United States mental hospitals are in fact destructive murder industries. Razor of Madness Expose Novel details this epidemic through an in-depth professional and personal investigation. For decades there has been a revolving door policy that still releases killers and pedophiles back into society. The maestro of mind control continues to haunt America to this very day. Razor of Madness is available in paperback or as a downloadable ebook at Amazon.com. I'm William S. Peckham. If you enjoy a good mystery with a touch of the paranormal, then you'll love my novel, From Out of the Woodwork. It's the story of a young Toronto contractor, Sean Kennedy, who buys derelict homes, guts them, and turns them into multifamily dwellings. Slums just waiting to happen. When Sean buys 29 Livery Lane, the house fights back. Former owners unexpectedly come out of the woodwork as he starts the destruction. The apparitions come to him when he touches old books, reads hidden letters, rummages through old boxes, finds a locket or reads a discovered manuscript of a murder mystery. From out of the woodwork, 
will take you from 1899 to the horror of the World Trade Center, September 11, 2001. Check out From Out of the Woodwork on my website, www.williamspeckham.com. Welcome back, everyone. Mark Music is my special guest, along with Douglas Wellman. They have written the book, Boxes, The Secret Life of Howard Hughes. And uh, it's available on Amazon.com and RightLife.com. Um, the money that was distributed to the members of his family who, you know, they, they went to the first funeral... Did they ever come out and talk about why it took so long for this money to come out? And did they were they finally told prior to your book that their cousin had died not when they suspected, but a number of years later, and that he had been married? I don't know that they've been told that, no. Did Howard Hughes have any children? Howard Hughes did have some children. Uh, history says Howard had, uh, you know, no children. Mm-hmm. We had uh, several people come to us um, indicating that they're the child of Howard Hughes. In the second book, we have two people in there. There's one named Cindy and there's one named John, who uh, both came to us and uh, told us their stories. And it took us a while to get our heads around what they're telling us. Uh, And then we did their DNA. Mm -hmm. And, of course, if you have the same uh, parent, you have a 50% match on DNA of which they had. And so you put that fit, that match of DNA together with each of their stories, and it becomes pretty convincing that you've got a child of Howard Hughes here. And so Howard did have uh, some children. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cindy was actually, remember, he was in contact with her when she was younger. She remembers um, him coming around uh, when she was very young. Um, and so... Uh, Howard's life was uh, uh, much more uh, uh, bigger, I guess, from a family viewpoint than what was ever publicized or what was ever thought uh, to be during his life. Did the siblings ever get any of his estate? No, no, they didn't get anything. Why wouldn't they? They never, they never got anything. Um, you'd have to prove that you're a, a sibling of Howard Hughes, and the only way to do that, I would assume, would be DNA. And there was no DNA from Howard to prove that. So, so I thought you said that you had DNA done. We had DNA done on the two children, between the two children, Cindy and John. We compared Cindy and John's DNA. I wish we had Howard's DNA because it would be a perfect match. So how do you know then that the DNA testing that you did on these two children were actually children of Howard Hughes? If you didn't have a marker to use as a benchmark, if you have a if you have a child and you have a common parent, mm-hmm. you have fifty uh, percent of your DNA matches. Right, but could it not two children? Could it not be that the mother of these two children were the same mother and not Howard Hughes being the same father? Well, that's possible, but there's a quite an age difference in these children, and their mothers are known. Mm-hmm. Their mothers are very well known of who their mothers are. And so the mother is not the uh, uh, the uh, uh, wild card here uh, on the DNA because they, um, uh, in both cases, the mothers are well known. In fact, we have the DNA of the one mother. Okay. But once again, I can't understand why these children weren't entitled legally to some of the the estate. Well, that would be a question to ask the uh, court system, I think. Did either of the children ever file a petition or petition the courts to to have any of his estate? One of the child uh, did go forward and tried to make known that she mm-hmm. was a child of Howard Hughes, and yeah. she just got shut down. By she who? She just got absolutely shut down. By who? By um, the, uh, uh, the person who the courts assigned to handle the family members. And the, that person didn't want to uh, open up the doors that there might be children. Did she go to the media with the story? Media wouldn't touch it. Why not? They just wouldn't touch it. 
That doesn't make sense to me. Does it make sense to you, sir? No, it doesn't. But it's it's that's a situation uh, that she found. She tried to get go forward, and and she got she went to two different uh, uh, lawyers mm-hmm. who were told basically to get out of it, and she went to a uh, uh, a uh, private detective to help mm-hmm. her, and he was told to get out of it, and they got out of it. There's a lot to hide here. Then how come no one is telling you to get out of it? Uh, maybe I haven't got to a certain level yet. But if you're coming out with the same information, sir, that others were told to get out of it because they had the exact same information that you now have that you're publishing in a book, it makes no sense to me why they were told to get out of it, and yet you haven't been told anything. No, that's and you're And you're exposing a lot more, so something doesn't make sense here, sir. Yeah. Any ideas why? Uh, the story is much bigger than what's in the second book. If the story is much bigger than what's in the second book, then shouldn't you not also be receiving the same kind of information that Mark Music get out of it? Well, I haven't gotten that. I haven't gotten that message. How long ago was your first book published, sir? First book goes out in twenty ten. So here we are eight years later, and you haven't heard from anybody. A child goes to a lawyer to try and get what they claim, based on DNA, is rightfully hers. She didn't have the DNA at that point when she went to the... She went forward, and it it was in the uh, 70s or late or uh, 80s when she went forward to try to to, uh, make the claim. But once you had the DNA proof, why didn't she use that in order to get the courts to take another look at it i don't know i don't know why she didn't she uh, that would be enough to her to do that and uh, maybe she didn't have the funds to do it or the funds to proceed with it but wouldn't i the way i look at it sir if if somebody came to me with a story as compelling and as as mysterious as this as a member of the media I would go crazy with it. My God, look what they're doing in politics today, and nobody's telling anybody to lay off. Yeah, I agree with you, but we ha- we have not uh, been able to make much inroads with the media on this book. Okay, let me see if I've got this straight. You've got <laughs> you you've got statements from the 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 now deceased wife of Howard Hughes that has confirmed to you his identity, given you. Proof, photographs, evidence that That's she correct. indeed That's was correct. married to Howard Hughes. She has filled in the spot. She is saying, hey, listen, Howard Hughes did not die when everyone thought he did. He was actually married to me. He went to da 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 dates, time, places that can be collaborated. Right. This is a mystery that no one wants to touch, and as a member of the media, I have to say, why not? Well, I, I, I'm with you on that one, Rob. I'm totally with you, because it's a mystery that, that uh, we have not really gotten the media to touch. Well, it's, something, always, it's always on the outside yeah. of it. Something that, that also raises questions is that if, if this story is true, and I have no reason to doubt you, sir, Mm-hmm. And the government or nefarious forces can actually do this. What else are they doing that we don't know about? Well, that's a good question. This is questions that other members of the media should be asking. Yeah, because that's a very good question. Because if this is being done in the case of Howard Hughes, where you've got the CIA supplying identities, faking a death. And all the other information that you were kind enough to share with us tonight and in your books, Mm -hmm. we can only assume that maybe President Kennedy isn't dead. Maybe he is in a hospital somewhere. If, If they can cover up the death of Howard Hughes, they can cover up the death and disappearance of anyone or anything. Yeah, that's, uh, that's definitely a theory. So why, you know, I, I'm sure that you, your publicists, and your co-author have gone to the media, issued press releases, and and done due diligence in getting the information out there. 
Mm -hmm. What has been some of the contacts that you have, uh, some of the feedback that you have received from the media as why they won't do interviews, why they won't do uh, do their due diligence and report this to the public? Yeah, what I what I typically run into, Rob, is when this when story first comes out, Mm -hmm. because the public has been told. You know, about Howard Hughes, died in 76, crazy man, crazy man, died in 76, crazy man, died in 76. That is what is believed. That is what is believed of what really happened there. Or they don't remember him at all. But uh, you know, let, so let young, me, they let, don't remember him at all. Let me give you and this. So, and, and, let me give so, you this, uh, General. We're running very short on time. But when everyone thought, based on the backward spin of a record and the and a few photographs on album covers that Paul McCartney was dead, that a double had been substituted for Beatle Paul McCartney, the world went wild. So I don't understand why the same effect is not happening or did not happen when it was revealed that Howard Hughes led a dual life and that he did not die when the 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 people were told that he actually lived a second life and this just boggles my imagination so i think part of the factor here also is the age, the age of him and when he disappeared because he really disappeared from the public in about mm-hmm. 1954 and so you've almost got to be oh 65 to even recognize the name because i've uh, talked to a lot of people who are 40 yeah and, and they say, who? General, I, I hate to do this, sir, but that. you and I have to say so long for tonight. I want to thank you very much for joining us. Continued success. And once again, General, thank you for your service to our country. My guest this hour has been Lieutenant General, a Major General, Mark Music, now retired. Along with Doug Will- Douglas Wellman, they wrote, the se- uh, let me see, Boxes, The Secret Life of Howard Few- Hughes. Why do I want to say Howard Hughes? Because it rhymes with Hughes, I guess. We'll be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Modern Esoteric, Beyond Our Senses by Brad Olson, consummates the lifeology story about where humanity originates. It is the lost continents, the primitive wisdom, the mythos of creation, and the rethinking of ancient history as we are taught in academia. There is much more to the story than what we have been told. As this is the first book in the Esoteric series, Modern Esoteric starts at the beginning of time and accelerates up to this modern age. Future Esoteric is book two in the series and takes a forward-looking position ahead of today with an open and honest examination of the ET issue and various unexplained phenomena. To discover the writings of author Brad Olson, visit www.bradolson.com. That's www.bradolson.com. Are you or is someone you know struggling with addictions, depression, anxiety, relationships, low self-esteem, lack of confidence, grief, success, and prosperity? Do you know that your subconscious belief plays a big role in the outcome of your hard work? We can help you permanently change the beliefs that may be the reason for your struggles and failures. We care about getting you the return on your investment and the results you are looking for. We can help you be free of the limitations of your past and in realizing your highest potential. We work with people by phone and Skype. For more information, visit us at www.ritasoman.com. That's www.ritasoman.com. Do you think you have energy problems in your home? Do you feel better when you're away than when you're home? Joey Korn is a global leader in the world of dowsing who specializes in personal energy clearing and space clearing. He can help you create an ideal energy environment in your home no matter where you live in the world. Learn about his remote spiritual house cleaning services and much more at www.dowsers.com. You can get Joey's book, Dowsing, A Path to Enlightenment, as well as other dowsing books and tools, Kabbalah books, and Walter Russell books. Joey's work is really amazing. 
Go to dowsers.com right now. That's D O W S E R S dot com or call 1 877 Dowsing. That's 1 877 369 7464.